Hey everybody, we've been covering the chi-squared analysis over the last couple of videos, and we've been working only with the one variable chi-squared kind of designs. Now I'm going to uh, shake things up just a little bit, and we're going to add a second variable for this chi-squared analysis. It's different from a, a single variable chi-squared analysis in some important ways, so that's what I'm going to focus on here. We're not going to go over an actual calculation of the example yet. I'm just going to walk you through the principles and things to watch out for and how this all works. We'll walk through an actual calculation in the next video. Okay, so if you have two variables and both of them are categorical in nature or ordinal, that's okay too, uh, then a chi-squared analysis might be appropriate. If they have more than ordinal properties, for example, they're getting interval or certainly ratio, probably not uh, correct to be using a chi-squared analysis. You should look into some other uh, analyses. Talk to somebody who, who's very familiar with statistics, for example, to figure out what would be best. And of course, the chi-squared analysis looks for patterns among those two variables and how they're falling. So in a very simple instance, uh, what happens is you want to see if if you're like if you're in one level of one of those variables, does that influence which level of the other variable that you are likely to fall into? Now that may not make a whole lot of sense at this point. It will as we cover some more examples, probably in the in the next video, of course. But we'll see how that works. Okay, so as I said, this video is just going to focus on the important differences in what we do when we have two variables for a chi-squared analysis as opposed to just the one. I think the most important starting point is to talk about how what we call the analysis. Now, when we had a single variable chi-squared, we would just name the level, the number of levels that the variable had, right? We would say it's a four-cell chi-squared or a two-cell chi-squared or a nine-cell chi-squared or whatever. And then we would also need to specify, do we have equal probabilities as our default assumption, or do we expect them to be something else and something specific as our default assumption? Now, when we have two variables, uh, we actually need to count how many levels that each one has, and then we name it in that way. We name it by the number of levels that both variables have. Okay. Uh, now, it's also important to note that this is sort of like a correlation in that most chi-square analyses, you can't actually name an independent variable and a dependent variable because that's not exactly how this works. We're not like introducing the variable necessarily and then seeing what its outcome is on the dependent variable. We're just looking at the association between, between two variables. So unless there's clearly some kind of uh, chronology to when the variables were introduced and then when the other one was uh, measured, sometimes we don't actually, we can't infer directionality. So uh, just take that into, into account. However, we can name the design based on which variable we're uh, using as the rows and which one we're putting in the columns, okay? So if the variable that we're using in our rows has two levels and the variable that we're using in the columns has three variables, we call this a two by three design. And of course, if both variables have only two levels to them, we have a two by two design. So let me give you an example of what that looks like. Let's imagine that we had some kind of situation where we wanted to see which kind of medicine seemed to reduce heart attacks, or if it did anything at all, compared to a placebo. Uh, we could set up something like this. So as you can see here, we've got two variables because we have both columns and rows. Remember, in a one-cell chi-square, we just used the rows, right? And the columns didn't act. Well, I mean, the columns showed it. There was one row, I should say. The columns would specify what level uh, it was. Now, in this case, we have both rows and columns. And so people can fall into one of these four cells. However, we don't call this a four-cell chi-squared because we want to specify that it has two variables. So we call this a two by two because there are two possible outcomes for, or two possible interventions, I suppose I should say, and then two possible outcomes of the uh, measurement period uh, for whether there was a heart attack, right? So in other words, we have two variables and both of them have two levels. And so therefore we call this a two by two design. Now, of course you can have a two by three design, you can have a three by eight design or whatever, um, but this is how you specify what it is. All right, just with any statistical test, we need to make sure that we're stating our null and alternative hypotheses. A little bit different from a one variable chi-squared, of course, so let's make sure that we uh, cover this very clearly. What we're essentially saying with a two variable chi-squared is that uh, which level of one of the variables you fall into should have no dependence on or effect on which level of the other variable you fell into. Okay, so that may not make a whole bunch of sense all in, a, in and of itself, but let's apply it to this scenario and maybe that will help. So essentially what you're saying is your likelihood of having a heart attack shouldn't be any different based on whether you got the placebo or the medication. That's our default hypothesis, right? Our default is always that 
we assume there's no influence of any variable on any other variable. So therefore, your probability of having a heart attack, for example, being in the yes had a heart attack column, uh, in this case, uh, yeah, column, should not be should be the same whether you got the placebo or the medication, right? The probability of both of those should be the same. Now you'll notice here it's also implied because if I'm pointing out both levels of the of the intervention category, I don't need to also list the other levels. So I don't need to say the probability also equals the probability of no placebo and also equal and, and no uh, medication. That doesn't actually work because we don't expect them to fall in with equal probabilities. Now, I'll show you that a little bit more. Hopefully, that'll make sense in a moment. All you really need to do, however, is address um, both levels of one of the variables with one level of the other variable. Okay, so as you can see, I've done that with only the yes column here uh, and not, uh, not uh, the no column because it's sort of implied that if this is true, then the no's should also be equal to each other. Okay, so now uh, let's look at the alternative hypothesis. So the alternative, of course, is that it actually does matter which of those uh, levels you received, and that will influence which level of the other variable you fell into. So for example, maybe it does matter which pill somebody, somebody received. That will influence whether you had a heart attack or not. That's what the chi-squared analysis will, of course, tell us. So what that alternative hypothesis could look like is simply this. You just say that actually you don't have the same probabilities. So if you, if you had a heart attack uh, with the placebo, you have the same, you did not have the same likelihood as having a heart attack with the medication that you received, okay? Now, this is important, however, because this works only with a two by two design, which is our current example. If you have uh, any, any variable that has more than two variables, um, it, it gets a little messy uh, to, to start stating what the possibilities could be. So instead, you just uh, say that there's something wrong with the null hypothesis, and uh, so therefore it is not true. So this is what you would state as the alternative hypothesis if one variable has more than two levels. Okay, it's important to note that we uh, calculate the expected cell frequencies in different ways than we did with a one variable chi-squared. It's sort of built into the table already, which is kind of nice because you don't have to decide, for example, should I expect unequal probabilities or not? It's already sort of built in here. You just make sure that you do this for every single time uh, that you calculate a two variable chi-squared. Anyway, so this is a pretty major difference between a two variable chi-squared and a one variable chi-squared. Um, now, it may strike somebody as, as intuitive that we should expect everybody to fall equally into all levels of all variables. Now, that would look like this, for example. Um, where you see if you, you've got a hundred percent of everybody and they would be equally divided among these four cells, right? The problem with that, like sometimes that might work if you expect 50% of everybody to receive the placebo and medication and you could design it that way, right? But you can't design it for 50% of the people having a heart attack and 50% having not. In fact, if anything, we would hope that there, there are relatively few heart attacks. And so this, this would be a mistake because we don't know uh, sort of at the outset that everybody has an equal chance of having a heart attack or not having a heart attack, right? So this is not what we should assume. Instead, what we need to do is what I'll show you on the next slide. What we need to do here is expect the number that we should see given, how, given the proportions of people, in this case, for example, who had a heart attack versus who did not have a heart attack. Okay, so what I'm saying is, look at this. Let's imagine that we had this, is regardless of which intervention people received, it looks like 80% of the participants did not have a heart attack. That's good, right? We want people to not have heart attacks. And 20% did have a heart attack, okay? So what we're saying is, given these levels, we, we don't expect these two to differ, and we don't expect these two to differ from each other, okay? So in order to do that, we need to do some calculations to find out what is the expected probability for this cell. We need to take into account not only how many, uh, how many people had a heart attack, but also how many people received the placebo versus the medication, okay? Now, by design, you may design it to be 50% placebo, 50% medication, but as I, again, stated, you can't design it to be this and this. As you can see here, we had 60% receive the placebo and 40% receive the medication. So that might be due to random assignment. Random assignment sometimes includes that, well, just more people happen to randomly get the placebo than the medication, for example. So sometimes that happens and that's okay. Anyway, the point is we need to take into account these differences over in these total columns 
to calculate our expected cell frequencies. It's not hard to do, so I'll show you how to do that right now. All we do is compute each cell's score individually, and we do that by taking the cell's column total, in other words, the column total that is in reference to that cell, we multiply it by the row total that is in reference to that cell, and then divide it by the total number of observations. Okay, so in other words, with this instance where we have, uh, let's take the very first cell where they did have a heart attack after receiving the placebo, what we see is we're going to take the total number of people that were in the yes column, in other words, everybody who had a heart attack, we multiply that number by everybody who received the placebo, we then divide that by the total number of people who were in our study. And what we get is the expected proportion of people who we expected to see have a heart attack after receiving the placebo, if our null hypothesis is true, and uh, which level of the variable you fell into had no influence of which level of the other variable you fell into. That's basically how that's done. Of course, I'll show you the calculations in the next video, but that's the, the basic principle there. Okay, and the last thing I want to talk about is how to calculate the degrees of freedom for your two variable chi squared. It's different from the one variable chi squared because we could just take the number of cells that we had and subtract one. However, now in this instance, because we have two variables, we're dealing with more things. There are essentially more restrictions to our uh, degrees of freedom. So we need to now uh, calculate that in a new way. Okay, all we basically do is take the number of levels that we have in variable one or variable A, whatever you want to call it, subtract one, then we take we do the same thing for variable two or variable b whatever you want to call it subtract one multiply whatever's left together and that gives us our degrees of freedom so in other words in this case we have two var variables with two levels each so we take one away from each of those and multiply whatever's left together that of course gives us two minus one times two minus one which is one mi one times one and one times one is of course one so we have one degree of freedom for a two by two chi-squared analysis. Now, if you had a two by three chi-squared analysis design, you would of course end up with two degrees of freedom because two, time, two minus one times three minus one is one times two, and that of course equals two. All right, so real quick recap, a two variable chi-squared does have some important differences from the one variable chi-squared. So I hope that you're familiar with both of them by this point if you've been watching these videos in sequence. For starters, the null and alternative hypotheses are a little bit different. In this instance, you have to address one entire level of one of the variables and explain that that doesn't affect either or any of the, of the levels of the other variable. Okay, that's essentially it. And then the expected cell frequencies are computed quite differently. You have to go through that little equation very quickly to compute the expected cell frequencies for uh, any given cell. And then of course, as we just saw, the degrees of freedom are computed differently. Now, the nice news here, however, is that the chi-squared statistic itself is computed in exactly the same way as we've done for the one variable chi-squared analysis. I'll show you how to do that, of course, in a future video, and we'll go from there. All right, I'll see you then. Thanks.